Some software is ephemeral, written once and then never touched again. Other software can be very long-lived, things like Microsoft Windows, Oracle's database, Adobe Photoshop, and so on. These are applications that have survived for decades and are constantly being added to and modified. As these especially long-lived pieces of software age, it can be very tempting as new techniques and tools come around to say, you know what, we should really take this opportunity to rewrite the whole thing from scratch, re-architect it, and make it better. This can be a good technical strategy and can pay dividends. However, you need to be very careful when you approach it from a staffing perspective. It's all too easy for it to wind up in disaster where you not only waste hundreds or thousands of uh, hours or even years of person effort, but you wind up demotivating your workforce, losing lots of people, and making almost no progress in the project in general for years. How does this happen and how do you keep it from happening? Hi, I'm John Miller, the Deliberate Engineer. I spent more than 30 years in industry working as a software engineer, principal engineer, engineering manager, both at big tech companies like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, and also at other places such as uh, academia, government, research labs, and so on. Over those years, I've actually worked on a number of v.next, in other words, the next version projects, uh, including two in particular where this idea of working on the next version while maintaining the old version and having separate code bases came about. The two that I'm going to talk about today are Universal Plug and Play or UPnP product for V1 and V2, and then something called the Compute Allocator, which is a portion of Azure that's responsible for placing VMs on physical hardware and data centers. After I describe these projects, I'll talk a bit about how they approached doing the independent development, how it worked out for them, and give some general advice on how to keep it from devolving into a complete de debacle if you decide to work on a team that has both V1 and V2 software being developed simultaneously by different teams. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Microsoft developed a technology called Universal Plug and Play. They both had a development team putting together a reference version of it, and they formed a consortium along with many other companies that worked on putting together a, a set of specifications and tools to let people make uh, sort of an internet of things, different devices that be, can be controlled. If you played games in the knots, you probably saw something asking if you wanted to have a hole opened up through your home gateway, or if you wanted to use universal plug and play to do this. So that was one of the uses of UPnP, along with controlling audio equipment, light switches, home automation, and so on. The first version of UPnP relied on several nascent technologies, such as SOAP and coding of XML, and web services. These gave it some real advantages, but they also were relatively heavyweight technologies and came with their own set of problems that we learned as we were moving along with the development. Somewhere along the way, management made the decision that we needed to rewrite the technology stack. And so while the V1 stack was still being worked on and released, they decided to form a new V2 product team that would make an entirely new code base from scratch using appropriate technologies and deliver that. He staffed this new V2 team with some of the best developers from the V1 team. As a result, we had this sudden ghettoization where the developers still working on V1 were the developers who weren't considered quite as good as those who got moved on to the V2 effort. What's worse, there wasn't any real code sharing between these two versions. So then there was a real question about, should we be adding new features to the V1 code base or not? The answer was no, by the way. And how do we uh, get the V1 folks up to speed on V2? And the answer for that as well was, well, Let's worry about that once we actually get it finished. There were two almost immediate side effects of this decision and way of organizing the team. The first was that the developers who were left on the V1 team were entirely demotivated and really disenchanted with the whole process. Many of them were good developers in their own right, even if they weren't the very best developers, and so it was easier for them to move on and find a different job instead of sticking around with this dead-end technology. The second problem was that this led to some resentment of the people who got to work on the V2 team. They were getting to do the fun work. They were getting to do the forward-looking work while the V1 folks were stuck doing all the unpleasant debugging and things you have to do to keep service up and running. There was resentment, but it didn't, as far as I know, it didn't boil over into any bigger personnel problems, which is a minor miracle as far as I'm concerned. As I mentioned earlier, all of this was almost 20 years ago. It was a long time ago, but my recollection is that the V2 effort eventually petered out and then was canceled after about a year into it. The end result was 
The V1 team didn't add any new features to V1. They didn't do a whole lot of fixing the bugs that were already there. And so development of the V1 stack kind of languished while the best resources were working on this V2 effort that ultimately got canceled. There was a UPnP V2 later, I believe, but that was a, a different code base and a different effort. That first V2 effort was suboptimal. It was like a train wreck that everybody could see coming, but nobody did anything more than say, oh, look, wreck impending, wreck impending. Nobody did anything to stop it. In my mind, this is the exact way that you shouldn't do the next version of a product while you're still having to support the old version. The second example I have is a happier one and sort of an example of how to do this right. As I mentioned, I worked on the Azure Compute Allocator team, which was responsible for the placement of VMs that customers asked to be spun up on the various hardware that was available to put them on. The existing allocator worked fine. It had dozens of rules that it had to follow to place things optimally or close to optimally. It was a combination of a scheduling and an optimization problem. Anyways, one problem that we were bumping into, which is a great problem for a company to have, is that the service was growing so quickly and so large that we were starting to have problems modifying the existing allocator to keep up with the load. We were going to reach a tipping point soon where the new allocator just wouldn't be able to handle it and we would have to do some pretty awful things to be able to still keep allocating the VMs in our larger and larger cloud. While we were starting to bump into some of the growing pains, a junior engineer on the allocator team devised a new approach to more efficiently calculating placement of VMs, something that might be orders of magnitude faster and require orders of magnitude less resources to solve the same problems. This was called the recomputing allocator or the recomputing caching allocator. He put together the design and then uh, the team just didn't wind up having enough time at that point to implement it, so it got shelved. Fast forward a year later and the need was greater than ever for the team to come up with a scaling approach. By that time, the original junior engineer had left the team, but the rest of the team dusted off his old design, took a look at it and decided this is a good way forward. The senior most engineer in the team picked up the design, looked through it, looked at the existing allocator and came up with a plan of implementing and updating and really uh, productionizing this plan that had put, been put together by the junior engineer. He did things a little differently than the UPnP team did. As he looked at this and came up to speed on the design, he educated other engineers who were still working on the old uh, compute allocator about what he was doing and why. He gave talks to people, he involved them in the design, he asked them questions about things. So they had a stake in this new recomputing allocator. At the same time, he also made sure that he spent a significant amount of his time working on the old V1 allocator and uh, doing his share of the ugly work like the, the on-call that we had, the on-call rotations, answering questions, fixing bugs, participating in meetings and the rest of it. There was never this feeling of him as a separate entity from the main team. And so what you had was a more collaborative relationship between those two teams. As he moved forward on implementing, he did most of the work. It was a very difficult problem. It took him more than a year to fully productionize the code. But as he went along, he involved more and more team people from the original V1 team, had them helping with parts of it. The development on the V1 stack wasn't stopped while this work was going on. Instead, all the new features and all the bug fixes were still being made to it. And when the time was right, the senior engineer who was leading the recomputing allocator effort made sure that code would be added both to the V1 project and to the V2 project. He foresaw a day where we would make a cutover and move to the recomputing allocator as a primary way of doing these allocations. And he made sure that everybody was involved in it. He also made sure the bridging strategy would be safe, reversible, and that he could prove that the scale would really be improved by this, this new V2 approach. Up until this point, I'd only seen bad examples of having separate V1 and V2 efforts. I was convinced that it just couldn't be done at all. But this fellow really showed that no, it can be done and here's the way that you do it right. So it is possible to have these separate code bases, but the key things are to make sure that development doesn't halt on the first code base in case there's some sort of an issue that makes you either cancel or defer the, uh, the V2 code base. Like in our example, it actually took an extra six months to deliver and we weren't hamstrung by lack of features in the old version while that was happening. You also make sure that the people communicate and uh, everybody feels invested and everybody feels valued. And he did a great job of that. UPnP and all the other earlier experiences aside, it is possible to do this V2 approach, but it really needs to be done deliberately. In summary, lots of large, long-lived software projects will find themselves in a position where they need to do a partial or a complete rewrite to be able to move forward. 
This can be done successfully, but it needs to be done carefully, especially with an eye towards all the engineering resources on the team, all the people who are working on the code. You don't want to lose all that institutional memory. You don't want to ghettoize the people who have been the heart and soul of the team uh, for the, the period up until you do this V2. You need to move very carefully, very deliberately towards that V2, keep the V1 moving along, and you can wind up having a positive experience, but you need to keep the people in mind. That's pretty much all I have for today. Do you have any experience working on v.next and on this sort of division in the development teams that you've been on? What's your opinion about this contrast that I showed? Is it realistic? Have you ever seen these problems? Do you have any alternate suggestions for how you might make a, a rewrite, a partial or full rewrite more productive? I'd love to hear more in the comments down below. Thank you very much for watching the video and keep on pushing forward. Hi, this is John. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please think about subscribing so you get notified of my future videos. Also, if you are interested, you might want to check out the video I have linked here. Thanks and keep on pushing forward.